have an announcement to make. Yesterday afternoon, shortly before six o'clock, the senior member of our faculty, Dr. Milward Rodin, was fatally stricken by a heart attack while conducting a class. Dr. Rodin devoted the major portion of his professional career to the development of the Department of Physics here. We extend our sympathy to the bereaved family, his wife Elsie, his sons Elward and Earl, and their families. Welcome to the fifth annual Nobel Conference on Communication. We welcome the students and faculty who come here from many institutions. We're glad that you braved the weather to join us. We welcome the representatives of scholarly organizations and representatives of the news media. We are fortunate in having with us for this conference world-renowned scholars who have graciously agreed to share insights with us on the subject. They will, I'm sure, add to the luster of the distinguished Nobel Conference participants of past years. I regret that I will not be able to be here for all of this conference, since I must represent the college at a meeting of the Central States College Association a meeting which was scheduled more than a year ago. We are fortunate, too, in prevailing upon the founder of this series of Nobel conferences to serve as the moderator. I refer, of course, to Dr. Edgar M. Carlson, who was the president of Gustavus for many years before he left us last September 1, to become the executive director of the Minnesota Private College Council. Dr. Carlson had much to do with the planning of this conference and in prevailing upon the participants to join us. Dr. Carlson, we're very happy to have you with us to preside over this conference. We welcome you, Dr. Carlson. Thank you, Dr. Swanson. It's a privilege for Mrs. Carlson and myself to be on the campus these days. I'm sure it's in accord with what you would expect of me, as well as of my inclination, that, and the nature of this occasion, that we should begin with an invocation. You may remain seated. Lord, we acknowledge with gratitude that thou art not through with us. We are but a fragment of what we could be. We need each other to become ourselves. We need to understand each other in order to fulfill our own nature and in order to enrich our neighbor. We ask thee to help us to learn by secret, the secret of the word, the word made vibrant and alive, the word made convincing and convicting, the word made flesh. So may life and language be joined for us and in us, and these days of sober searching become also days of glad discovery. Amen. The declared purpose of the Nobel Conferences is to hold up for inspection and discussion an important contemporary issue which is at least in part the product of scientific and technological advances, but which has broad social and moral implications. The aim has been to have the ablest minds we could gather, discuss with each other and with a broad cross-section of the academic community in this area, the facts with respect to this issue and a discussion of their implications. We began with genetics and the future of the race. 
we move to the counterpart question of environment and its control. That discussion pushed us toward the question of the nature and limits of the rational process by which we presume to exercise some control over our environment. And this preoccupation with the mind in the third conference led us in turn to inquire whether all mental processes were uniquely human and whether whatever was unique about them was the sum total of the uniqueness of man, which was our theme a year ago. When we gathered with last year's participants to seek their assistance for this year's theme, a number of possibilities seemed open, but the prevailing sentiment was that we should focus on language and communication. It was felt that something very important remained to be said about the human mind and about the uniqueness of man if one were to do full justice to the interpersonal and transpersonal aspects of our human existence. The mind conceives and uses language through which the individual enters into community with his fellows. This is a part of the nature of man and the uniqueness of man. It is most appropriate that we should begin this discussion by listening to one of the most articulate spokesmen for what I think we could call the humanistic approach to scientific questions, who is also one of the most highly regarded practitioners of a scientific discipline. Dr. Leroy Augenstein is chairman of the Department of Biophysics at Michigan State University, East Lansing. He is a much sought after lecturer on a variety of subjects and generally makes us aware not only of the scientific issues involved, but also of moral and social problems related to them. We look forward to hearing what he has to say this morning on the intriguing topic, a little black box called the mind. Following his lecture, you are invited to submit questions that may occur to you, which will then be submitted for his response. Dr. Augenstein. Thank you very much, and before beginning, let me speak certainly on behalf of myself, and I'm certainly of my colleagues on this program in congratulating you people on the very fine series of commemorative lectures that you have held. Uh, they have certainly acquired a great deal of renown in a very few years, and you're to be complimented. And certainly, I think this whole topic of communication is a logical next topic to consider in the <clears throat> sequence which you have been choosing because communication covers many, many op uh, operations and activities. The simplest, of course, is the cry of uh, warning in a case of a disaster, or the cry for need of food or shelter, or something of this sort. But communication also involves trying to get across to someone your love for them, your concern for them, an attempt to get across ideas, and perhaps most importantly, the attempt to get across values and behavior, and what, should, what our behavior should be. And once you begin to get into this area, and it is one which I want to emphasize very much this morning, this whole, this whole concern for persuasion and manipulation, you suddenly are beginning to tie a lot of things together. Because when you first began to talk about the control of environment and her man's heredity and where man is going, throughout all of these, we are beginning to talk about the quality of man and our ability to control it, to anticipate what it may be like. And in a sense, what we are now doing is to, we are in a transitional period. In the past, we could ask, what is man and why is he here? Now we can ask the further question, what would we like for him to be and we can do something about it? And suddenly we can no longer divorce science and what we want to do with that science. And it is in this vein that I will cast my remarks this morning. I will spend about half my time in trying to indicate what we can and cannot do in this whole area of the control of the mind, 
and then to spend the remaining time to ask what do we want to do with these new capabilities. Certainly, one of the most startling and exciting ex sets of experiments that have been done in recent years were done at, a, at the start of the space age at the, in the laboratory of Dr. Hebb at McGill University. Many people became concerned as it became evident that we were going to send people, astronauts, out into space for weeks, months, perhaps even years on end, that we really had little knowledge of what happens to a person when you put them into isolation where they get only very limited communication, either with others or even with a surrounding environment. And a number of laboratories spent a great deal of time and effort trying to design experiments to evaluate this question. But Hebb's group designed perhaps the simplest, and we got a bonus that we had not anticipated. Because what they did was to pay students by the hour to go into an isolation room and just to see how long they could stay. Uh, they paid them something less than a dollar an hour. And initially, they anticipated that they could stay in this room, which was soundproof, vibration-proof, draft-proof. The lights were carefully controlled. In fact, initially, they even had them lying on a form-fitting contour couch and put mailing tubes around their elbows so that they couldn't reach up and scratch their nose and ears. And they anticipated they might stay in there for a month and had set aside an appropriate amount of money. They were quite surprised that the students, in fact, almost without exception, could not stay in longer than two or three days. And in fact, near the end of this period, they had some pretty wild hallucinations, and there were some rather profound changes in their sensory perception. But the point I want to make is that they found, of course, how clever you students are. Most all of them would go in after a late heavy date, so they got paid for 10 to 12 hours of sleep time. And then when they awoke, they wanted to go to the bathroom, and there was a bathroom unit in the area, and a, also a place where they could pick up some sandwiches. But very quickly then, the fun began, because these students would try all sorts of clever tricks to get the people on the outside to communicate with them without themselves turning the doorknob, because that stopped the payment. They had a microphone in parts of the experiment, not in all of them, but in parts so that they could speak out, but there was no loudspeaker coming back. And we have a report that one fellow, without any warning whatsoever, suddenly blurted out, unless somebody speaks to me within the next 30 seconds, I'm going to commit suicide, and began to count. One, two, three, on up the line. The most delightful story, though, is a fellow who claimed he had, he had just flushed the toilet, the toilet was stuck and overflowing, and unless somebody came immediately, he was going to drown. <laughs> Now, as it turns out, few of the attempts were either this novel nor dishonest, but practically everybody tried something. And so Hebb and his group began to ask, OK, if they crave this communication, let's see what they'll accept. And so in the second part of the experiment, they gave them a switch so that every time they pushed the button, they got a very long, very obnoxious, pre-recorded commercial. And the, rules, and the rules were that once it started, they could not play it. They could not stop it. It had to play all the way through. And it really was quite unbelievably bad. Uh, and amazingly enough, most of these students played this over and over again. I think the least number of times was eight, and the maximum was up in the 50s somewhere. And this was now during about 30 waking hours on average. And so the, quest the next obvious question was, are they listening to this junk, or is this just to break the monotony? Because when I'm in my study, the stereo's on, but you know, don't ask me what's there. It's there. And so in a third part of the experiment, they pre-selected students who neither admitted nor professed to believing in uh, flying saucers or any of the supernatural. They put them into this room, or had them go into this room. This wasn't put in. They, were, they went in by choice. And now what they did was to substitute for the commercial an even longer argument as to why they should believe in flying saucers. And it really was quite badly overdone. If I, I heard this particular one. And if you believed in flying saucers and listened to this once or twice, it almost made a non-believer out of you. It, as I say, it was, it was fairly bad. Interestingly enough, this recording again was played over and over, about the same number of times. When these previous non-believers came out, they not only believed in flying saucers, they would go off and try and convert their roommates. And furthermore, this, appears, this belief, if you want to call it that, appeared to persist for quite a long period of time. And now suddenly you can see why I said we got quite a bonus that we had not anticipated. Because this seems to suddenly say that in a situation of sensory deprivation, a person is willing to overwrite information, or either erase or at least to overwrite. And such a technique, it's I guess what we would call brainwashing, although the previous brainwashing was a misnomer, 
In this situation, this could be used for fantastic good or fantastic bad. Fantastic bad, of course, if someone, some group of people, were to choose to use this for political control. But you just can't discard it that easily because it could be used for fantastic good when you consider that 50% of our hospital beds are occupied by mental patients. And if we could use these techniques to bring these people in and say, look, here are the rules and regulations by which you've been operating. They're bad. Get rid of them. Erase them. And here's a good new set to write in. This would be a fantastic tool indeed. Well, the situation I've just described is what pertains some five, six, seven years ago. And that's where it sits today. Because there are few people who really have the courage or perhaps the arrogance, I'm not sure which you would call it, to really see how far this technique can be pushed. In these experiments, only a small change was made in a person's values. But the question becomes, can these techniques be used to literally take a person apart and put him back together? And we don't know, and the experimenters who are concerned in this are asking themselves the question, does anyone ever have the right to find out? Because if you try to find out and you fail, then suddenly you may have a, a shattered individual. And in fact, some people argue we don't even have the right to go in and to play games with a person's inner beliefs. That's his business. The only thing that concern, can concern society or others is how he behaves. And in fact, some people are now arguing that this is the only thing that you should manipulate. And in fact, there are, some now exp there are now some experiments uh, in Lovas's lab out in uh, California, which indicate that in certain situations, again, you can manipulate quite easily uh, individuals' behavior. In this case, they have worked with very, very abnormal individuals, autistic children. That's spelled A-U-T-I-S-T-I-C. Some of you may have read or, or heard about these youngsters. They're about as totally withdrawn as an individual can get. They simply don't respond in any normal way to communication. And what Lovas and his, well, let me just back up for a moment. In fact, some of these youngsters are also quite self-destructive. For example, if you turn them loose, they'll gouge big chunks out of their cheeks. Or uh, in, in some cases, if you restrain them from doing this, uh, put them in a straitjacket. If you don't restrain their head, they'll uh, turn and, and literally take bites out of their shoulders and this sort of thing. What Lovas did was to say, let's see if we can take advantage of the fact that every human, every individual, has a little bit of the animal in him, animal instinct, and let's see if we can use the normal techniques that we would use in training animals. And so what they did was to put these youngsters into a room in which there was an electrified floor, raise the relative humidity enough so that they would conduct quite readily, and then put these youngsters in there and just gave them random shocks. And the only way that they could get away from the shock was to go and throw themselves into the arms of someone, an adult, sitting at the other end of the room. And this was the person who was now going to try and, and enter into therapy with them. Or in some cases, they would just starve these youngsters. Literally, they wouldn't feed them for three or four days, and then they would feed them an ice cream cone when they went and threw their arms around some other youngster. And in fact, they would work them in pairs so that they had two youngsters, uh, they were operating on two youngsters at a time. To show you how potent these techniques can be, let me describe one specific case that they had. This was a youngster, 11 years old, who had spent seven of his years strapped to a bed because every time they turned him loose, he would, he would try and take big chunks out of himself. In fact, he had almost chewed through the uh, tendon and bone in his left shoulder. They brought him into the room, and in this case, Lovas wasn't sure that the shocks to the feet would be enough, and so he got a big cattle prod, you know, one of these things where you can really give a person a real jolt of, of electricity. And uh, they now stripped the child down naked. And he said, all right, turn him loose. And immediately the child turned to take a bite out of his shoulder. He gave him a good zap. And uh, the child shook his head and looked around very startled. Paused about 10, 15 seconds. Turned to take a bite out of the other shoulder. Got another uh, shot of current. Looked quite bewildered for some 30 seconds to a minute. Very hesitantly turned towards the other shoulder. And the third jolt was all he needed. Never again, as long as he was in that laboratory, did he try this behavior. Then they began to use the shocks to the feet and began to get somewhere with the youngster. There's interest, and in fact, there's an interesting sequel to this story. After about a month, they felt that they were making progress, and so they took the child back to the normal ward from which he'd come to go on with the therapy. Within the day, they got a call and, which said, we thought you said this child was cured. He's back up to his old tricks. Well, when Lovas went over there, he found out, interestingly enough, that once the youngster got back into the old environment, he immediately drew some blood. The nurses would come up, 
grab him, pick him, and you know, start loving him and cuddling him and telling him he shouldn't do that. This was his way of getting attention. And so with their so-called love, they were rewarding this abnormal behavior. This evil cattle prod, you see, could be used to, to reestablish more normal behavior. And what is good and evil in these situations? Well, quite clearly, these techniques indicate that we may, on down the line, if we so desire to go in this direction, have a remarkable facility for beginning to manipulate and control either what a person believes or how he behaves. The question becomes, how do these things work? Well, we don't know how they work completely, but we're beginning to find out some things about the various processes that must be involved in either brainwashing or behavior manipulation. Because to do this, you must get information in, you must store it away, and you must then retrieve it in preference to other information so that the person operates on the basis of this new information. What do we know about these various processes? Well, in our own laboratory at Michigan State, we've made a, uh, we have a continuing series of studies over the years in which we've asked, how do people process information? And we find, interestingly enough, that each of us behaves in a rather analogous fashion to a digital computer. It turns out that you have a definite capacity for processing information. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 20 to 30 yes-no decisions per second is about all that you can make. And uh, you may make less if you're not properly trained in, in, the, in the test that we might be performing. Furthermore, we now know that this is not a limitation imposed by the input process, because if we take fairly complex displays and show them to people for very brief periods of time, we find that a person can take in in a 40th of a second far more information than he can process in a second. And furthermore, you take this information in four or five times a second. So unless you just happen to misdesign the experiment, the input process is not the rate limitation. It is rather this processing unit of ours which imposes this. And in fact, in doing some very carefully timed experiments, we find out that people do not process information on a really continuous basis. In other words, you can't arrive at a decision just any old time. You either make a decision now, or a fixed time later, or a fixed time after that, or a fixed time after that. And this fixed interval appears to be about a 30th of a second. In other words, this appears to be our unit operation time. And so we're beginning to find out how much information you can get in and how you get it in. In fact, our strong suspicion in our own laboratory is that you process information one yes, no decision at a time. But the question then becomes, what happens to it? How do you get it on back into the memory? Well, we're now finding out uh, in various laboratories that there are at least four or five memories, or I should say places where information is stored, uh, uh, for varying lengths of time, but there are two of major consequence to us here this morning. There's a short-term memory where information, processed information is stored for anywhere from about 40 seconds, uh, I'm sorry, for a, from about five seconds up to 40 minutes before it is then incorporated into the permanent memory where it appears to reside for something approximating 100 years. Although as I get older and my memory gets worse, I'm not quite so sure about this latter number. So perhaps I should justify by giving some experiments as to where these numbers have come from. Let me take first the 40-minute estimate of time that information spends before it's stored away in the permanent memory. Over the years, there have been continuing claims that certain kinds of psychotic disorders can be very effectively treated by uh, electroconvulsive shock. This is where you put an electrode on each temple and now pass a very potent surge of current through the brain. It is so potent that the person is knocked out and they recover over a period of, of hours. If the next day the clinician asks the patient, were the electrodes cold or were they too tight when we put them on or was the cot uh, comfortable on which you were sleeping? Invariably the response was, what electrodes, what cot? And in fact, they had great trouble remembering what had happened in the previous 30 to 40 minutes. And in fact, with certain kinds of anesthesia, ether being one of these, Again, people will usually remember you putting the mask on, but they have trouble remembering what happened in the previous 30 to 40 minutes. And so, for quite some time, this was interpreted as the time that information spends in the memory before it gets incorporated into the, uh, in the short-term memory, before it gets incorporated into the permanent memory. And if you now go in with electroconvulsive shock or ether, the idea was you erase this information and, and it is lost. And in fact, some experiments with white rats some 10, 12 years ago seemed to confirm this. What they did was to take a group of rats, put them into a maze. You know, this is where you have to make a lot of left-right turns to get to the cheese at the other end. 
and they put them into a fairly complicated maze, such that it took the rats about two weeks of practicing 15 minutes a day to learn to run with no mistakes. And then they said, okay, they took a second group of rats and they put them in the maze for 15 minutes a day, but then took them out and immediately anesthetized them with ether. They never learned to run. They dropped dead of old age before they did. They took another, still a third group, and put them in, let them run 15 minutes a day, but waited two hours before they gave the anesthesia, and they learned almost as rapidly as if they hadn't been anesthetized. And then they tried varying periods in between, and the, again, the critical time seemed to be some 30, 40, 50 minutes. And so those of us who were concerned about this all thought, aha, this is a unique time for all animals. And then some idiots ran one too many experiments, I should say some very bright idiots, and fouled this up. Again, these were run with white rats. They put the rats into a cage with an electrified floor, and in the middle was a wooden pedestal. They put the rats on this, and of course, being inquisitive, they would quickly jump off in a matter of a few seconds. And when they hit the electrified floor, they would go sailing into the air. While they were in the air, they turned off the current, picked them up, took them back to their cage, and then they would bring them back. Oh, anywhere from five minutes to an hour, a day, a month, a year later, it didn't matter. They put them back on the pedestal and they sat there and quivered. They wouldn't jump off. It was one of the few cases of one-shot learning that, uh, that we know about. So I said, okay, now let's see if we can erase this, this knowledge. And so what they did was to put ear clips on so that they could pass a surge of current through uh, analogous to electroconvulsive shock. But they found they couldn't wait 40 minutes. They had to almost catch them in the air within some 5 to 15 seconds. And so, again, those of us concerned in this area said, well, Apparently, the time spent in this short-term memory depends upon the urgency of the information. Well, there are now subsequent experiments, fairly involved ones, which indicate that that was quite incorrect, that in fact, information is being stored away all the time. It doesn't get erased. But depending upon the circumstances at the time of the storage, it may have a nice big green flag on it that says, you know, this is very pleasant, recall it every few minutes, you'll be pleased that you did. Or it may have a big red flag on it that says you better not mess with this, it's pretty unpleasant. And in fact, if you just think about yourself, you know that there are many things that you can retrieve easily, and there are other things that you just can't get at, uh, except with rather unusual methods or an unusual circumstance occurring. <laughs> in fact, when I lectured on this in our biophysics course at Michigan State, in some quite greater detail, in the subsequent exam, one of the students said, I have that information stored away, I just can't retrieve it at the moment. <clears throat> and we pointed out in our own brutal professorish fashion, you know, you only get rewarded if you can recall it during a specific 50 minutes of your life. But there is far more stored away than we can get at by normal methods. For example, uh, uh, hypnosis can in some cases be used to pull this information out, although in hypnosis we have problems. You not only get out what's there, but it often is embellished. The person being hypnotized tries to please the hypnotizer. But there are also, again, some experimental operations that are beginning to indicate that we do have far more stored away and in great detail than we can get out uh, in, uh, normally. These particular operations involve the implantation of electrodes in human brains. And the most uh, extensive data that we have on this comes from the group who have been operating on people with Parkinsonism. You know, this is where older people get this uh, shake in their hand. Now this is caused by a malfunction deep down in the switchboard region of the brain, down in the thalamus, and a surgeon dare not go in there with a scalpel because the damage he would do on the overlying material is far greater than having the palsy itself. But you can go in there with an electrode. This is a stiff piece of wire that is insulated all except at the very end. And so what they did was when they thought they were close to the proper region, they would stimulate with a weak electrical current, just the kind you would have in normal brain cells. And if they, once they got in the right region, the person would become almost rigid. They would then uh, turn off that current, anesthetize them, and pass a powerful but very brief surge of current through that region and just burn a microscopic hole in the brain. And they get very high cure rates for this one form of Parkinsonism. Now the point I want to make is that they began to stimulate with a weak current continuously as they passed through the overlying regions of the brain with quite remarkable results. For example, they would be carrying on a conversation with the patient because the patient must be conscious. And I see some of you screwing up your noses. You shouldn't because you have no feeling of, of any pain or anything else once you get past the outer layers of the skin. And they would be carrying on a conversation with the patient. 
And suddenly, uh, they would pass the electrode a millimeter further. And now, mind you, in this case, they're stimulating with this extremely weak current. And suddenly, the patient would just blot out. They weren't with it. In some cases, they would suddenly uh, begin to carry on a conversation with someone who wasn't in the room. Or in one case, they had a man who suddenly uh, let out a big sigh, like this. And the next day, he said, you know, I would swear I was at Lake Tahoe yesterday, yet the operation took place on the East Coast. The most, um, the most famous case that they had was of a woman 62 or 63 years old, who suddenly began to hum a piece of music just in the middle of this conversation. As luck would have it, one of the people in the room was a musician who recognized this as a piece from a very obscure quartet. And so after the operation, he went back to the lady's room with her and began to hum this piece of music with no obvious recognition. But he kept persisting, and finally she said, you know, I've heard that somewhere. And then eventually she, she got the name, and then she said, oh, yes, I've only heard that once in my life. And she gave the day, the month, the year. It had been some 23 years before. And she said, my husband and I, the, these were people from the East Coast, had been out in the West on a vacation. And we were coming back, and we stopped in this little town in Ohio, and she gave the name. And she said, at 4.30 in the afternoon, we went up to the Grand Hotel and registered, and we saw the advertisement for this uh, you know, musical thing in the evening down at the Roxy Theater at 7.30, and we went down there, and it had the brightest red door, and on and on, this kind of detail. Now, the interesting thing was, they went back and checked. Every detail was, in fact, correct, but the Roxy Theater and the Grand Hotel had burned down some 15 years before, so there could have been no immediate recall. One of the groups in the country who are, have done these operations now have approximately 50 such cases where they have documented detail in great detail, these, that these just aren't embellished old soldier tales. And so, again, we're beginning to find out a little bit about how this information is stored away, where it's stored away, and, in fact, from some other operations involving uh, uh, people with epilepsy, it now appears that in a very few cases we can even get the electrode into the right place to trigger off specific uh, reactions. The question, though, becomes, and it's one that we started with, what do we want to do with this information? For example, if, and I emphasize if, because you can see that we're beginning to see that we may be able to do some of these things, but in many cases we can't do them now. But if we can begin to get to the place where we could change red flags to green or green flags to red, there are some situations where we would very much like to be able to change a green flag to a red, in other words, to suppress information. I'm sure that many of you, like myself, were horrified three years ago to read about the story in Los Angeles of the policeman's daughter who was out selling either Christmas cards or Christmas candy, and suddenly was drug into this house and raped repeatedly by this bunch of thugs. Although she's had the finest psychiatric care available, she reverted the behavior of an eight or nine-year-old child. She simply cannot forget the happenings of that day. If we had some technique whereby we knew where the happenings of that day were stored, or at least we could suppress the you know, retrieval of it, we could probably retrieve this girl to a full productive life. But the problem becomes, if you begin to go in and start this form of erasure almost, who decides what you erase? I say only half-jokingly that if they start doing this in my wife, there are a few things, that, just a very few, that I shouldn't have said over the years, that somehow she never forgets that I would love to you know, get erased. Uh, but she might not quite agree with all of them. Who does make this decision? Or if we can begin to really manipulate deliberately, almost take a person apart and put them back together, who should decide what we do with a Carol Chessman? You remember, this was the man who spent some 12 or 13 years on death row. Wrote a, a book that indicated that here was a very fine mind. It just happened to have one quirk. He liked to go down lover's lanes and, and uh, uh, drag the girls out and rape them and kill their escorts. Now, if somebody could have gone in and changed those quirks again, we would have probably retrieved a person to, who would have been of value to society. But who should decide what values you put in? Should it be the Carol Chessmans in this world? He's gotten himself into that fix. Maybe he's not the best one to choose. Should it be the psychiatrists? Most psychiatrists take the position, I think very wisely so in most cases, that they should get a person to understand themselves, not decide what they should be like. But in many cases, that will only make the situation worse because abnormal as that person's behavior may be, in some instances, if you start skimming, you know, cutting off red flags, suddenly you may have a person that's in even worse trouble. Should it be the parents who make the decision? After all, I don't know the situation with Chessman, but there's a chance that he was in that problem because of his parents. Or should it be society? 
In fact, I've given you four alternatives. I'd be interested in seeing a show of hands as to where you people think the decision should lie. How many of you would say it should be the prisoners, the Carol Chessmans in this world, who make this kind of a decision? See a show of hands. Yeah, it's not too many. It's kind of like 1%. How many of you would say it should be the psychiatrists? A few more. How many of you would say it should be society in some role or other? Still a few more. Does that leave it all up to the parents? Or how many of you aren't voting? In fact, joking aside and the Carol Chessmans aside, let's just talk in general. And I want to see an honest show of hands here. How many of you would say that by and large, parents should be responsible for the values that go into their children? Okay, that seems to be most of you now. Let's ask the much more critical question. Suppose we can, in fact, develop the techniques for brainwashing to the point where you can very deliberately and very precisely put a set of values into your youngster. I don't know whether we can, but just I want to make a point here. Let's play this game. This now means that you can raise your child absolutely permissively for five, six, seven years, or at least as long as you can stand it. And then one day you bring the child in and you say, okay, kiddo, today's value day. And you, you know, you... You just kind of program them like a you kind of program them like a computer. It has the virtue that if we could do this, you would know precisely what values went into that child. How many of you would like to use that technique? Well, I'm sorry, but I'm a bit confused. You told me that parents are supposed to be responsible for the values in their children, but they're not supposed to be deliberate about it. That seems to be a definition of sloppy parenthood. And you chuckle, but you get the point. What obligations do we have to a youngster we bring into this world? All too often, tragically enough, people think that all you have to do to be a parent is to procreate a child. Unfortunately, two fools in a drunken stupor can do that, and for my peace of mind, do it all too often. No, the proof of the parenthood, particularly for you young people, is going to be not just bringing a child into this world, but giving it a set of values by which it can compete with, uh, with the surroundings that it finds. And I would say very strongly and very categorically, if you're not prepared to take that responsibility, and literally it's the responsibility of playing God for that child, then don't bring it into this world. But not only do we have an obligation to the children we bring into the world, what obligation do we as a society have to those youngsters whose parents don't give them a set of values? And I want to spend my remaining time asking this question because it is the preeminent question facing America today. And we find these youngsters throughout society turns out that the largest fractional increase in our crime rate is found in our white upper class uh, suburbs today. Also, the hippies neither come from the ghetto nor are they rebelling at the ghetto. But still, the most worrisome place that we must face this question is in the ghetto itself. Because I think all of us know that unless we solve this problem involved with our ghettos, this country of ours is going to come unglued and it's not clear that we'll be able to put it back together. And so let's ask this question. What obligation do we have to youngsters, particularly in the ghetto, whose parents don't give them a set of values. I know I grew up, or went to the University of Chicago many years ago, just when the south side of Chicago was in a tremendous state of flux. And I've seen what one individual can do to another over and over again, in terms of not giving them a set of values. I and six of my colleagues lived on the third floor of an apartment building. We lived in what we thought were rather crowded quarters. But then the floor beneath us went ADC. Grandma and her three daughters and, and their offspring moved in, a total of 23 of them into the same area as we occupied. They were supported, as I say, on this program of aid-to-dependent children. And don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking the program. It's a fine program. They were just drastically misusing it. Because this mother said quite blatantly, uh, the mother of the oldest male member of that household, who was a little fellow by the name of George, he was seven years old, she said quite blatantly, the break-even point for boardroom and liquor was five kids, and George was second in line. He was locked out in the morning. He spent his time on the front stoop. He was let back in at night to go to bed, and that was about it. At age seven, George had never seen a book, never been exposed to one. I and another student were the only semblance of a father that he'd ever had because we were the only males that ever stopped to talk to this little Negro boy. We used to check books out of the library, <laughs> fairy tales, and my brain would look at us with a very you know, quizzical look because we were obviously a bit young to be legal parents and too old to be reading these books ourselves. But it was quite a, it's quite an experience to try and read a book of fairy tales to little George. He doesn't know what you're talking about. 
So you knew, looking down the line, that little George had very little to look forward to. And I moved away from there into a nice non-ghetto situation, and I promptly forgot about these things until in 1966 when I first campaigned for the U.S. Senate in Michigan and then later on for the State Board of Education. I spent a lot of my time in the ghetto area, and I can no longer forget. Let me give you just a couple of my experiences to illustrate what I mean and then to go on and ask the question I want to ask. I'll never forget one day when I was in Detroit in the counselor's office in one of the ghetto high schools. And this counselor, who was normally a very happy-go-lucky guy, was very down in the dumps. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, I think I just sentenced three boys to jail. He said, I had to kick them out for disciplinary reasons. He said, they really weren't all that bad. But if I didn't kick them out, discipline in the, you know, throughout the school was going to go to pot. The problem is they have nowhere to go. And I said, again, what do you mean? And he said, you come around tonight when you're through campaigning, and I'll show you. So at 11.30, I met he and two of his colleagues at the appointed place, and they told me where to drive. And we went down and stopped in front of this building that was a so-called apartment house. I wouldn't have gone in under other circumstances. And we went down this narrow, dimly lit hallway, and he very quietly and slowly opened a narrow door that was obviously to a janitor's broom closet. Standing in one corner, leaning back, slightly upright, fast asleep, was our first young man. It was a warm place. We went a block and a half down the street to an even worse place, and our second young man was sleeping in underneath the stairs in this building. The people in the hallway across the, in the apartment across the hallway were good enough to let him in of a morning to use their bathroom facilities. He owned exactly two pair of pants, three shirts, and one complete change of underwear. Those were his sole possessions in life. And I said, why doesn't he go home? And he laughed a wry laugh, and he said, home? He doesn't know what the word means. He never knew who his father was, and at the age of uh, eight, his mother left him at the neighbor's while she went shopping. A few days later, an envelope came with $25 and a note which said, Joe and I have gone to Arizona. When we strike it rich, we'll send for you. Apparently, they haven't struck it rich because he was then 16. I'm told that there were 8,000 such youngsters in the city of Detroit, and that was before the riots. God knows how many there are today. And, you know, and Detroit is not unique. If you read the McCone Report from Watts, you'll find the same general kind of situation. For they, the rioters there were a remarkably homogeneous group. Most of them were young fellows between the ages of 14 and 22. They picked them up and asked them, what's your name? Joe. Joe what? I don't know. At first, they thought they were trying to avoid detection. And then they found out, no, they were like our second young man. They had never known who dad was. And in the warmer climates, the most common time for putting him out on the streets is 8, 9, 10 years old. In fact, they went into one of the largest housing developments in Watts. And 336 households, exactly 11 of them were headed up by a male, a father. And then we began to ask, why don't they behave the way we in middle class do? And it's kind of obvious. Well, the question is, where do you put values in if you want to put them in? One place, certainly would be in, the, uh, in pro programs such as Operation Head Start, you know, where you bring these youngsters in who are three, four, five years old and try and teach them words and concepts. Because uh, for most of these kids at that point in life, they will probably have a vocabulary of maybe five, six, seven hundred words. By comparison, my little boy, who's now three and a half, has an estimated vocabulary of almost 7,000 words. And so if you want to give these kids any chance of competing, you've at least got to give them a, vo a vocabulary to work with. And to show you what our people are up against, one of the girls from Michigan State who was doing her practice teaching in Detroit stayed on uh, two summers ago and was uh, participating in one of these programs. And she had 10 youngsters in her room one morning and was showing them pictures of toys that you would find in most middle class homes. She held up a picture of a teddy bear and she said, can any of you identify this? There was a long silence and finally one little girl said, is that a rat? And suddenly this tells you what you're up against. Well, the people in Operation Head Start will tell you, who have participated for a while, will tell you that, yes, it is important to teach them words and concepts, but that that isn't the important thing that you get across. The important thing is to simply sit that child on your knee and say, look, little Joe or little George, it's important to me that, you're little, that you are who you are. This is probably the first time that anyone has ever said that and meant it. And I can tell you from my experiences with our little George, Whenever we came up to him, there was an initial period of recoil because even at his age, he had been had and had bad by society. But once he was convinced we were sincere, suddenly that little mind opened up. Here we had a blank slate on which we could write. And now in, in, uh, with the little Georges and, and the Operation Head Start kids, our society faces a brutal choice. 
Should we go the next step further and say, incidentally, little George, if you want to get along in this world, you'd better adopt my middle class set of values? In fact, again, I'd like to see a show of hands. How many of you would say, no, we do not have the right to impose our values on anyone else, particularly anyone else's child? You have just consigned that youngster to society's scrap heap. Without a set of values, he cannot compete, unless you're willing to tear the whole fabric of our society apart. How many of you would say, no, we have an obligation to give this youngster a set of values so that he can compete? And the question is, whose values? In particular, can those of you who said you would not be responsible in a deliberate way for giving your own child a set of values ever presume to impose your values on someone else's child? And although it is difficult to give an answer to this question, it is a question which we dare not disregard. Because as I said before, if we don't solve it, this society, and solve it quick, this society of ours is going to come unstuck. Well, there is somewhat of a halfway situation that can arise, as my wife and I found, where you can have not a one-way communication, but a two-way communication. My wife and I uh, started what we thought was something brand new, and we found out that others had beaten us to the punch some 10 to 15 years before, but we started a program called Operation Get Acquainted, in which we took Negro ADC youngsters and put them into white middle-class homes for a week to 10 days just so both sides could find out what the other one was all about. This youngster is now at the most formative years of his life. He can find out, is there something in this middle class setup that I want to adopt? Maybe he doesn't like what he sees, and okay, so he'll get that from it also. It also is a time when uh, the white middle class who can keep the dar door barred against this youngster, if, if they want to, can also find out what his strengths and weaknesses are. And my wife and I, in participating, have found that there is a need for a real exchange of values. We had two youngsters in our home uh, in the past two or three years in this program. One of these came from a home where the best thing they could do is to take the child out of the home. The mother was terribly bright, but totally incapable of love. This child was as starved for affection as any I've ever seen. But the other one was quite a different situation. This was an eight-year-old boy. He comes from uh, the following situation. His mother uh, had a common law marriage, and which was actually more stable than some of the legalized ones. Four children came along, and then a birth defect that she had became apparent. She began to have disfiguring warts all over her face and body, quite unattractive to look at. And so the husband took off. By this time, she had four children. The oldest one was a girl who's now at the age of 14, one of the worst hunchbacks I've ever seen in my life. She stands about so tall, weighs about 50, 60 pounds. Her back is just like a question mark. The second child's been operated on twice for a brain tumor, and they've had to remain, uh, remove enough of the brain tissue that uh, the child reverts literally to animalistic behavior periodically. The third boy is barely trainable, and the fourth one is the boy we had in our home who is you know, abnormally normal. This woman also, since we've known her, has had two serious and painful operations on her feet. If ever anyone had the right to say, I quit, she does. And yet, you know, that's one of the finest homes that I've ever seen in my life. Everyone in it has respect for every other person. If my son grows up with the same kind of respect for his mother as this young lad has, I'll be delighted. We have, re we have acquired a tremendous respect for this woman. She knows it, and it's been something beneficial for her. Well, it's this kind of exchange that we can have. But this kind of exchange must occur if we're to solve this problem. And so let me simply close by asking, what are our obligations, each and every one of us? The first obligation, it is one I repeat for you young people. It is that if you are going to bring a child into the world, don't bring it unless you're prepared to give that child a set of values and to the trauma that goes along with it. And I mean that as sincerely as I can possibly make it. Don't bring that child into the world. But we older people also have an obligation. All too often, we preach one set of values and live another. And in many subtle ways, we can say to you, our values are not of great consequence. A clergyman friend of mine recently had uh, one of his parishioners come in who couldn't understand why his son had been sent to the penitentiary. Uh, he had been a lookout on, a, on a, a filling station robbery where the other two fellows involved had beat up and almost killed the station operator. Didn't take my clergyman friend long to find out what had gone awry because this family had had a station wagon for years with a seat that faced backwards. And this young man's position on Sunday afternoons was to sit in that back seat and keep an eye out for the police as his dad sped along. 10 to 15 miles an hour over the speed limit. That father had been saying, had been imposing a value in a very subtle and unsuspected way on that lad for a long time. 
Or you see, we can talk about the universal brotherhood, universal love of man, and yet it falls on deep ears and will continue to fall on deep ears in younger generation so long as the most segregated hour of the week is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. And so our generation has an obligation to very carefully relook at our values and make sure that they are consistent and reasonably close to what we're living. I don't say get rid of all hypocrisy, because hypocrisy is an important item for progress. If you don't aspire to something better than what you are at the moment, you'll never progress. And so a little hypocrisy is fine. It's just when it gets out of bounds that you get into trouble. But the main thing our generation has to do, and when I say my generation, you know, those of us who can't be trusted, those of us over 30, is to exhibit a bit more guts and leadership than what we've been doing recently. All too often we say to the younger generation, here are my values, but they're not really very important because you should go and check with all these others and don't really believe mine. Because I know on our campus at least, and on many other campuses, the young people are searching hard for a new leadership to rise up, a positive leadership. Up until now, the activists have given us mainly negativism. They're telling us what's wrong with our society and the protests and so forth, and this is of great value. But you see, to set things right, you have to switch from the negative to the positive. And it is now very, very clear in many cases that that early leadership cannot provide this new positive direction. It is this which those of us in the older generation, particularly those of us in teaching positions, must begin to provide to these young people. Because you see, there are no non-simple solutions in this world. And all too often, many of the hippies in particular have been saying, if you don't give me a simple solution, I'm going to opt out. I'm not going to play the game. There is no such thing as a, as a simple solution in this day and age. And it is this kind of leadership, the leadership which says there are fundamental values, which are important. Now, be sure that you know exactly which of these you want as you begin to determine how you're going to operate, how you're going to put these to use. And it is this which I don't think we're doing. Because if our generation doesn't do that, then I'm afraid that the decisions I've been talking about this morning may once again be decided in the streets of Chicago or Minneapolis or some other place. And God save us if the decisions in this area are decided by people rioting or demonstrating in the streets. You'll never get a, a decision of the kind we need, of the complexity that we need in this area with that kind of decision-making process. And so I'm once again saying that we are in the position of controlling the quality of life in this arena and in many others. And once you have the capability, suddenly you have no choice but to make a decision. The price which you pay each and every time a new capability becomes available is a very high one indeed. The name of the price is responsibility. Because once mind manipulation becomes available, no matter what you do, we're going to play God. If we choose not to use it because of the dangers, then we have played God for that poor person, that psychotic individual that we don't even try and retrieve. Yet for the same token, if we go ahead and use it and decide what a person is going to be like, then we have certainly played God for that individual. And so the fact that we have no choice means that we have to begin to approach these things very, very carefully. We must find out what our science, what capabilities our science is giving us. But more importantly, we must ask, what do we want to do with these new capabilities? Because the stakes in this and many other areas are desperately high. Because you see, the mind is the last sanctuary for many things. And depending upon how we use these things, we will determine a fantastic amount of good or bad. If we use these techniques properly, we can go out and destroy the last sanctuary of ignorance, incompetence, and inequality. But if we misuse them, we can also go out and destroy the last sanctuary of individuality and integrity. This is a choice which we dare not disregard. sample of the quality of <coughs> this Nobel conference and of the Nobel conferences that have gone before it. Now you have opportunity to raise your questions. You're invited to write them on the cards that you've received, to pass them to the aisles where you'll be waited upon by the ushers who will bring them forward. Those of you who need to leave may do so now. We invite you all 
who can to remain. You still want this up there on there? The first question that I have been asked to address myself to is the following. What do you think about parents teaching only the values of basic honesty and otherwise confining themselves to teaching their children how to think, not what to think? Is this proposed teaching of how to think rather than what to think consigning people to society scrap heap? Uh, my answer would be almost probably yes, because it turns out that I find a, a worrisome number of youngsters making their way to even my office, a professor of biophysics, who are in serious trouble. And invariably, the problem with them is that this is exactly what has happened, and then they suddenly run up against a crisis and they don't have a, a fundamental set of beliefs from which to rationalize. If you teach a person only to rationalize, but they have nothing from which to rationalize. They have no ethical system. You see, any ethical system must start out from a basic set of premises. You say, this is what I believe to be true today. Now, since man is finite, we can never know ultimate truth, and therefore we must start out from some premises. Now, the only question is, where do you get these premises? Once you have those, then you can begin to rationalize your system. Now, the only question is, do you get these premises from uh, religion, from divine guidance, from past history of what has worked, or just out of the air somewhere. But that's really the only question. But you must have a reasonably logical set of premises from which to start, or that person is going to be in fairly serious trouble, or at least this has been my experience. Now, in fact, what the person is saying here, I think, is almost impossible to ever achieve. Because, in fact, the, the very attempt to say, I will teach you how to think, not what to think, in essence says to that child very early and, and for a, on a continuing basis that there is nothing that is really right nor wrong. And this is an important ethic to get across to a child, for better or for worse. That child's probably going to have some problems. And so with our children, we really don't have a choice of whether we will or will not put in a set of values. We will put in a set of values. It's only the question, which one will we put on, in, and then how will it be modified later by society? And certainly this is a tremendously continuing process. But this, this business of putting in value starts at a very, very early age. Uh, to give you an illustration, my little boy, uh, well, while, when my wife was pregnant with our Davy, I had a young girl come to my office that it took me a long time to recognize simply did not know the difference between right and wrong. She simply had never been taught uh, that there are some things for which you're going to be rewarded, some for which you'll be punished. And I've now seen three or four of these people who literally have never formed that concept. And I talked to one of my psychiatrist friends and asked at what point do you begin to put in the concepts of right and wrong? And he said, well, it's obviously a continuing process, but at least the most black and white initial concept of right and wrong begins in the first year of life. And so I decided that from the age of three or four months on that Davy was at least going to know my definition of right and wrong. And so when he misbehaved according to my standards, since he had none, he got spatted on the bottom just enough that it was unpleasant. I don't believe in child beating. And also when he did something that I thought was right, I picked him up and told him he was the greatest little guy in the world. At the age of seven months, he was strong enough to pull himself up one evening on a lamp table, reached up and very gingerly touched the uh, leaf of his mother's prize African violet, looked across the room and shook his head very vigorously, no. Now, this is a very naive approach to right and wrong, but at least the concept that there isn't a right and a wrong can be gotten in even at that early age. The whole concept of sanctity of life can be gotten in, in a terribly sophisticated way. Already at the age of three years, uh, we told our little boy about uh, my wife was pregnant with our little girl who's just now five months old. 
And we told Davy uh, when he was just a little past three that, you know, God had set up a system in which a seed is planted in a mommy's tummy and the child uh, grows there until it's strong enough to kick its way out. And uh, he began to ask some terribly sophisticated questions. First, he began to ask about the mechanics of just how did the doctor get this, help this baby get out when it went to the hospital, and which takes some doing to get around at age three. But the second day, he began to also ask, oh, then then humans really love their children more than, than the birds because they put them in eggs or the seeds that go in the ground. And then about a week later, he began to ask, now just why was this seed planted in mommy and not somebody else? And just why now and not some other time? And uh, he's now beginning to ask the question, how did the first woman come along? Did God put the seed in the ground to get the first woman or, or uh, just how? And as I say, there's been a whole up increase in his concern for this whole sanctity of life. And so we oftentimes downgrade how early these values go in. The second one says, if given that set of values by the electrode means, will they be able to question and perhaps subsequently reject that set of values? Well, again, we have no idea how far we can go in this regard. We can only conjecture from what we currently know. But I think more and more, many people, and I used to be one of the non-believers, uh, are beginning to believe that we have to pay attention to the old dictum, give me your child to the age of seven, and I own it the rest of, of its life. That while we don't buy it in its entirety, certainly many of those concepts that go in at this very early age are there. You may not obey them, but you must operate around them. I doubt that you can usually get rid of them, has been my own personal experience. Can you say you can identify yourself with the ghetto problem in, in America? The answer is no. Uh, I cannot. I can only to a very limited extent. As it turns out, with the spelling of my name, Augustine, many people are not sure whether I am or am not Jewish, and to some people this is important how you spell the end of your name. Uh, and in fact, my wife and I choose our friends very deliberately. When we go to a new town, we never go to church for the first six weeks. And we find that those people who are concerned about the spelling at the end of my name are very good people to avoid. But I can chicken out. The Negro can't. And so in that regard, I can never know. The kind of prejudice and the kind of, of self-doubt and the kind of rebellion which must be there in the ghetto individual. I can only surmise what it is, but I can never really totally comprehend it. And it says, or do you feel it for a while, and then when you want to turn your mind away because you can't really picture yourself in that situation? And, uh, well, I've just answered that. Can the values of the white and black people come together without a clash? I think we must, anyone who is a responsible individual must do everything within his power to see to it that they do without a clash. Uh, maybe we can't, but I think that we must do everything possible. It says, the generation gap derives in part, for those of us in college, from the values our parents and communities visualize we need and the conflicts they pose with the reality of our world. How about those accepted values? How do we change some of society's values? Well, one way that they dare not be changed is in the streets, uh, the way the attempt was done in Chicago. Uh, and in fact, I would say to, you, to the generation of the kids in the college that you have your work really cut out for you to avoid the kind of hypocrisy that you are now criticizing. You see, someone has recently characterized this generation as being hypercritical, but not hypocritical. And up until now, I think that's correct. But now, if all you do is to criticize, but then do not go the next step further and begin to set things aright, you will be every bit as, hyper, as hypocritical as those you are now criticizing. And so having once criticized in the way that you have, you have a far greater obligation even than my generation did to begin to set things aright. Now the question becomes, how do you do this? Well, there are many ways. I can only tell you the one that I've chosen, and the one that I've chosen is to get more intimately involved in politics, and will continue to do so, because by and large, many of the decisions which must be made today and are not being made, ghetto decisions, what have you, I say are not being made because in all too many situations, our governmental structure keeps very carefully sep uh, separated the three kinds of forces that must be brought to bear in making decisions. The scientist with his knowledge of how and what is possible, the humanist with his set of values, and finally the politician with his knowledge about how to make things work. 
And by and large, we keep these, these people apart. Uh, it, it's not deliberately, but it's certainly we keep them apart. And uh, I think that this, there are great hazards coming along. Now, let me give you quite a different area to illustrate the point. Currently, before the Food and Drug Administration, uh, and in fact, it's, on, it's been on the desk of a friend of mine, uh, two applications from two different companies to license for use for testing in humans two drugs that have been extremely effective in combating leukemia. Both of these drugs produce their effects by causing a tremendous number of mutations, some of which are catastrophic, and furthermore, these mutations are now passed on to the next generation in the laboratory animals. Suddenly, you've got a whopping decision to make here, and it can't be made strictly on political grounds, nor strictly on value grounds, nor strictly on scientific. We must begin to get together these kinds of forces as we make these decisions. Now, fortunately, my friend happens to be a very ethical individual, and they've been sitting on his desk for two years because of this. But all we have to do is to release one of these drugs too soon and to have another thalidomide, and boy, we're off to the races in this country. Or all we have to do is to have somebody go out and deliberately begin to take people apart and put them back together and to have some serious repercussion, I mean, you know, in terms of mind manipulation, and we're off to the races again. And so you ask, how, do you, how must you begin to change these values? One of the things we desperately need is to relook at our whole decision-making apparatus. And certainly, I think one of the things that the responsible kids, I'm not talking about the irresponsible, but one of the things the responsible kids in Chicago were saying is, if we're not represented, you will not hold us accountable. That's what the Negro's been saying. Perhaps properly so, perhaps not. I don't happen to be someone who goes into the streets. But this is what these people have been saying. And I think one of the things that your generation must do is to see to it that whatever changes you make ensures that people are, are represented, but represented responsibly, not irresponsibly in the streets. What future do you see in using your electrodes to methodically remove prejudices from our minds? Well, I see a very rosy future if you let me decide what prejudices were to get out. <clears throat> Assuming we as parents or as a society could ascertain which prejudices were wrong or bad and should be retrieved. Uh, I don't think that we'll really use electrodes. Uh, first of all, we look rather strange, you know, running around with a beanie covering up the plug-in unit. And uh, there, are much, there are much simpler ways, I think, to do it. I doubt that the electrodes will do it. I think that the, that the virtue of the electrode... Uh, uh, I started to say experiments or experimental operations, is the kind of information they are giving us about how information is stored away. I cannot foresee that except, well, I, I really can't foresee that we would use these to any great extent. There are other ways of doing it. Do you think the government does accurate, accurately reflect what the people want? Well, the question is, and it's got in quotes, the people, and I don't know who you're talking about. Are you talking about the people who don't care enough to get out and to vote and to work and to earn their right to be heard? Or are you talking about by the people? Do you mean those people who are willing to go out and do the hard work to make sure that they are represented? Now, the people who don't care and don't get out and work and then later complain and rebel, I have little sympathy for. Because I have found out in my own case that it is possible to be heard. For example, in, in uh, the summer of 1966, I, de I decided to run in the Republican primary for the U.S. Senate. I had almost no political exposure up to that time other than my own precinct. I spent about a third or about a half of my time. One of my colleagues spent about a half or about a third of his time and five students almost flunked out of college and we came within a whisker of getting the Republican nomination for the U.S. Senate in Michigan in uh, February 14th. It can be done. But you have to want it, and you have to want it badly. And so if, by putting in quotes, the people, you were talking about the people who care enough to get out and do something, then I would say, yes, our government does reflect them. If you're talking about the other people, I have little sympathy for them. <clears throat> and incidentally, when I say little sympathy, I mean exactly that. Because democracy can only flourish when you have well-educated uh, well and highly motivated people. When you don't, society will decay. What future do you see in using electrodes? Whoop, 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 that's the one I just answered. Put them in the wrong pile. <laughs> oh, I 
Why did I call the mind a little black box? I should have explained that better. Because in our laboratory, we have, in our experiments, been treating the mind as a little black box. It is a device that processes information, it stores it away, it retrieves it, and it also uh, is uh, a little instrument that uh, is pretty predictable. We, in our experiments, and they have been what we call human engineering experiments, simply treat the back black box as a computer. You put, you have information going in, you get responses out, and we have therefore been trying to ask what goes on internally in order to account for this. We have not been asking so much how is this done internally as what is done internally. And so in this sense, it's almost treated as a little black box, for better or for worse. Why can't a person indicate a direction to the values and not the values themselves? That's kind of like saying that you're in favor of motherhood but against pregnancy. I don't know how, the, how you can possibly accomplish that. Would you define what you would include in a set of values? Do you limit what I take as an authoritarian view toward responsibility to impart specific values to moral and aesthetic values, or would you include social and aesthetic values? Well, again, I don't really think that these are separable, but I can tell you what values, what fundamental values I think are important. Because one of the functions that I have been serving for the last couple of years is that of a ex officio genetic counselor. Uh, as many of you probably know, it is now possible in many, many cases to predict what the chances are of a given set of parents of, of conceiving a seriously abnormal child. In fact, uh, I believe Sheldon Reed uh, was at your first Nobel conference and talked on this extensively. In fact, within the last two years, it has now become possible midway through the pregnancy to actually remove amniotic fluid and to run a large number of tests to determine what that fetus is going to be like. And now some very, very messy decisions come up. I can give you an illustration of one. Uh, six weeks ago, I was asked by a couple if I would give them advice. They're in the following situation. They had anticipated that there would be serious trouble, or there had been serious complications in the pregnancy, and so they had removed amniotic fluid at the fourth month. They now took the cells that they found in this amniotic fluid, cells from the fetus, and now stained up the chromosomes and examined them very carefully, and they found a chromosome abnormality, which guaranteed that if that child were going to be born, it would develop normally for some five, six, seven years, but then its central nervous system would begin to degenerate and it would go into convulsions and seizures and die a very brutal death over the next four, five, six, seven years. This couple desperately wanted a child. The mother was 36, has never been pregnant before, and due to a quirk of circumstance, they are ineligible to adopt. And now they were asking advice on what should we do. Or I was asked uh, a little over a year and a half ago to counsel a, a grandfather and a grandson in a situation where the, where the grandfather desperately needed a kidney. He was going to die very quickly if he didn't. The grandson's cells match very well with grandfather's. Prediction was uh, that the uh, uh, operation would be a success with close to 100% probability. But the grandson would almost certainly lose 10 years of life expectancy because the breakdown of the grandfather's kidneys is, is something that runs in the family. But it turns out that the grandfather is an outstanding surgeon who operates on and saves some 300 lives a year. He operates in a remote section of the country, and they've been unsuccessful in getting another man to come in and take over his practice. In fact, he was operating one year beyond normal retirement because of this. And the grandson happens to have a two-year-old child, and his wife is pregnant. And I was asked again, as were other people, what our advice was. Now, in trying to give this advice, I've had to begin to ask myself, what are the things in which I really believe? And when I talk about values, now I'm not talking about operating procedures. I'm talking about those fundamental premises that I must start with and, and then go from there. And I've slowly winnowed it down to five. And I can give them to you. You may not like them, but if you, if you don't, I would suggest that you ask, what do you really believe in? The first value is that I believe that there's an orderliness in the universe. I believe this simply from observation and extrapolation. Everywhere I look, I find this order, whether it's in the uh, atom, in the genes and chromosomes, or in the mind, at least, at least the male mind, or in the physical universe. And since I find this orderliness there, I believe, and it's simply a matter of belief, that there should be an orderliness in the way in which individuals behave towards each other. This then implies that I believe that there's a right and a wrong. And in this regard, I, I 
uh, disagree with some of my colleagues uh, who would say that everything is relative. Secondly, in, in fact, this is just an aside, but it is impossible for anything to be totally relative and ever make a decision that something is better or worse than the other. You must have some gauge against which to measure it. Secondly, I believe this orderliness was created. In other words, I happen to believe in a God. Third, I believe that there's a sanctity to life that should be obeyed in all possible situations. But when I say life, I no longer mean just a heart that beats or lungs that breathe. We must now talk much more extensively about what we mean by the sanctity of life. And in fact, I include three factors in this. I think we must not only be concerned with the sanctity of biological life, but the sanctity of psychological life and also of social life. Let me give you an illustration because I think this is an important point that's often overlooked. Suppose that you had three couples in neighboring rooms in a motel on a Saturday night and they all procreate a child. The first couple is unmarried, never intend to get married, and when they part company the next morning, they never see each other again. The woman insists on keeping the child with her in a small town and it's socially ostracized. The second family is married, but they know that they have a bad set of genes. They go ahead and procreate a child anyway, and it spends a life not knowing who and what it is and in considerable misery in an institution. And the third couple's kosher all the way. You know, they're married, they've got good genes that works, they just don't happen to give that child a set of values. And so it ends up in a penitentiary. I ask you, which of these couples is the most immoral? Well, your first reaction is that, and many people would argue, you can't give an answer to this question because, you know, everything is relative. I would state precisely the opposite, that in fact you can't give an answer to this because there are absolutes, and I've chosen my three cases to illustrate very carefully and depend exclusively upon one of the sanctities of life. The first child had its, its life, its sanctity of social life violated. The second uh, couple violated the biological sanctity of their child. They gave it a bum set of genes. And finally, the last one violated the psychological sanctity. Fourthly, I believe that there's a life hereafter. Uh, I don't think I'll have a set of golden wings grafted on like my grandmother did, but I believe there is a greater scheme of things in which I'll participate, and this makes a difference when you're talking about transferring kidneys or euthanasia or what have you. And finally, I think that the most important principle which should guide my actions towards other people is Christ's uh, concept of agape, the non-selfish, non-passionate love. And this now has an important implication, because it does imply that therefore I have an obligation to use the old cliche to be my brother's keeper. For example, when many of these counseling situations come up, and I could give you some even more hair-raising ones that I've been involved in, you might say, why stick your nose into their business? Very simple reason. They asked me to, and I feel that if I believe in this concept of agape as the most important principle, then I do, in fact, have an obligation to do what I can when someone requests my help. And so these are my five. You will notice that one of them I didn't put in there is honesty. This isn't because I, I uh, either admire or, or compliment fibbing. I don't. In fact, I abhor it, whether it's me who yields to temptation or someone else. But in some cases, when I'm counseling a couple, I may think that the most humane thing I can do to them, do for them, is to tell them a big fat lie if this were, will protect their psychological well-being. And so these are the five from which I now rationalize what I'm going to do in any given situation. I see our time's up. Those of you whose questions were not dealt with in this period may wish to know that the questions, all of the questions, are turned over to the speaker for his review and reflection at the panel tomorrow afternoon. You may therefore hear from them again. We thank you. The next session, 2 o'clock this afternoon in Alumni Hall.